This video is sponsored by Squarespace. All right, so I've wanted to have this conversation for a long time, and I know you've heard me mention Tejada or Tejada Style or John Tejada. This is the guy, the legend, John Tejada. Again, if you're not familiar with any of his music, please go check it down below. I got links to it all there. So, you know, we, we talk about this stuff all the time, like the 2400, which is just off camera, or any of the older vintage ones, and we, I think what we talk about the most is how much of a pain in the ass they are to use, but at the same time they're, that they sound really good. So I just was wondering, why would it be a good idea to buy a vintage sampler today? Well, I think the main reason is vibe, right? Um, they offer something quite significant in their workflow and their vibe, but I think you kind of have to look at them in a kind of historical aspect. So each of these machines, when they came out, they really changed the game. Like mm -hmm. the SB12 all of a sudden gave you 2.5 seconds, <laughs> and then the Turbo gave you 2.5 uh, seconds. Yeah. And it retained the memory when you switched it off, which is something the 1200 didn't do. And then the 1200 gave you 10 seconds with a floppy drive, right? So, I mean, when I was in high school, that would have been incredible for me because I had like a looper pedal and a four track. Mm -hmm. So, to get in the mind frame of those machines now, it's almost like natural childbirth. Like, you could do it, but you might want an epidural in a hospital filled with doctors, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what you're looking at. I mean, if, if you're a young producer curious about these machines, that's a really cool way to dig into, like, historical ways of working and into music tech. But if you're coming from Ableton already with all the plugins and everything, and now you're trying to make this machine work for you with, you know, 10 seconds or whatever it may be, a S950 or something new, which we'll get to, which is has an extra layer to it, yeah. I think. Um, but I think without going through those motions of experiencing those jumps in technology, it doesn't make as much sense. Yeah. But for me, let's say, for example, I really like the Akai S612. And I think you mentioned that on your channel as well. That's very, very simple you can put you know if it's not modded you can put one sample into it it's got sliders it's super instant you can do one sound at a time kind of like a simpler yeah and it makes a lot of sense but when it comes to a very limited piece of gear where you're trying to have it drive your whole studio then that becomes a little bit of an issue it depends which way you want to go with it right mm -hmm. now when there's a new piece of gear that's so much focused on the vintage and the limitations but then you've got some modern features then it's like where's the line like we were talking earlier because we talk all the time like yeah. you said about you know uh there's no lfos or maybe no you know parameter locks like now that's just that's something electron changed again within the 2000s so mm. now every new machine is expected to do a type of a parameter like lock new right standard so if you're way. gonna yeah. put out a vintage machine and then you add a little bit of modern to it but there's a lot missing you know it just it just depends what you want to do and what point in history do you want to jump in and deal with that, you know, because I mean, our heroes all use these different machines you talked yeah. about um, over the last year. So it's an interesting journey, but if you're making music for a living, then there's also, you know, some decisions you need to make as an artist of what's going to work and what isn't. Yeah, I know. I, I think that's an interesting point to kind of where you're like, you can kind of pick and choose what headache you want to deal with in history because I have. The 60 and I absolutely love the way it sounds and I also absolutely hate that it has no filters at all it's like oh this pad is so cool but it's just blaring the entire time but back in the day you would have never thought about it you know, I know what's a filter <laughs> <laughs> why would every sample get a low-pass filter right yeah but yeah. now yeah of course every sample needs to have a multi-mode filter yeah so you can buy our standards in. and LFOs and you know, so... Yeah, because from there, then I'm like, okay, cool. I'll just jump to the 3000. And that has filters. It's just one. Okay, that's more than enough. But then at the same time, you start like, oh, well, now I'm just strictly this pattern-based workflow. And I can't really do, like, multiple patterns with different lengths. And But I guess at a, at a time, you kind of, you still appreciate the workflow but at the same time i always tell people they're like oh man you have the 60 or the 3000 should i get one of those i'm like please don't like 
you, what do you use to produce right now? And they're like, oh, I just have like a MacBook and, and push or something like that. I'm like, you are going to hate the MPC workflow, like especially the old ones. The new ones are cool. You know, I mean, for me personally, I, I tend to have more issue with the new ones because it has so many of those modern features where that sort of like comfort level that because I did come up with certain models and learn those like that's a that's like a happy place of making music for me. Sure, it can't do a lot of things, but now it's got all of the modern features and I kind of don't know where they are. So I have I have more of a struggle with the newer models. Yeah. So it all just depends on, you know, if you were there for that. If, then, then there's some comfort to it. You know, it's right. like for us playing vinyl. Um, for some new DJs, it's like so a lot of my happiest memories are from finding a record, right? Or yeah. being homesick and 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 like trekking to the to the record shop yeah. and finding something great. You know, um, but now it's it's digital, and if somebody didn't have that experience, then it doesn't really matter, and that's totally fine. Um, yeah. So I think it's kind of the same with gear. It's just I have these memories of happiness, like struggling to use something, you know, <laughs> um, and the, the people that I met during that time. So I, I think it goes a little bit deeper of just wanting to use a piece of gear that doesn't work right. <laughs> right. Would you say that that, I mean, I guess this is all subjective and it's all relative to anyone's like tolerance for struggle. But do you think that that's the novelty of it? Is the struggle, or is it, is it the sound, or is it the idea? You know, because like there's there's different levels to this, right? Because I know, you know, there are some people out there who are, in a in a way, pretty egotistical about the gear that they use, and they're like, no, none of that new stuff is garbage. Well, that's know? that's always going to be something with, with anyone, any, any anything, any profession, cars, yeah, yeah, skateboarding, whatever, right? Yeah, and if if something makes that artist or that performer or the athlete special they're gonna you know that's Hang gonna be part of their identi identity yeah i i think those machines weren't a struggle to use that's the thing they were amazing when you got a hold of them and you dream of having this shitty thing right and because at you're the coming time from... it was amazing and you didn't know that one day all those problems would be solved but now we're you know in 2021 there's new problems, sure, but all, you know, the tech has moved so far. So to use something like that, it's a whole different way, a whole different level of perception than it was when that was like the king yeah. on the block, right? Like, uh, like to your example, MPC 60 Mark II, like that was it, man. You yeah. Know? Um, but now it's hard to tell somebody how great and important that machine was when all they kind of might look at it and see is all the things that it's missing you know again a lot of these machines they have a particular sound like one of my favorites is the casio fc 10m which is the rack of the casio fc1 mm -hmm. sampler mm -hmm. and that has a very special filter in it um and that's something i haven't seen replicated so that's something that's very difficult for me to use but i will use it to get that sound right yeah. like I don't there's no VST models that I'm aware of or anything else that will replicate that sound so those are some hoops I'll jump through if I want that LFO frequencies sound right um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at with the vintage gear like it, it needs to serve a specific purpose or it's kind of like I mean this is seems a bit lavish but it's or it's sort of like my Game Boy I'm not exactly trying to make finished productions but I'm going to have a lot of fun with this thing, you yeah. know, like I'm just going to use it. It might not, not, none of it might be released, but it's just going to make me happy to use it. Yeah. So, I mean, making music should make us happy. So, um, <laughs> and not frustrated. So I think, yeah, every, every tool is going to work differently for somebody else. I'll, I'll never forget this video I saw of, I can't remember which, uh, DJ producer it was. I want to say it might've been premiere. Um, but they were um, sitting next to the MPC 60 and he was like, yeah, when this thing first came out, like it was really dope, it was cool, but it was lacking stereo samples and it was kind of low, like it wasn't really hi-fi and this and the next, but all of that is solved with this. And it was the MPC 3000. And like to see how excited he was and how great, like groundbreaking this was 
to him, who's a producer, who's like really prolific, uh, I'll link that video down below. It's really awesome to see. I, I guess that does make a lot of sense because I'm t looking at it from, you know, the future traveler who comes back in time and I'm like, you were using this, you know, versus them where they're like, oh my God, this is the future, you know, but to us today, it's completely, completely uh, archaic. I love that then they were chasing the hi-fi sound and today we're chasing the garbagey lo-fi sound. Right. I, and I remember, you know, back, back, back then when some of my friends had 1200s i don't think anybody was very particularly fond of the fact that you had to loop things and record them in at 45 and slow them down mm -hmm. uh at the time i had an eps and that was a little bit on the grungy side too yeah. and none of us actually really enjoyed that but it was a huge staple of the genre yeah. of that sound and those limitations so now of course classic tunes we want our sounds our songs to have a bit of that magic right yeah but that, yeah like you said that's the other thing like hi-fi was always the goal yeah yeah and now with that exact same instrument it is considered lo-fi by today's standards well i hear you talk about and i know you use a ton of vsts to kind of chase the sound i guess for you in this sense using a vintage sampler is for the most part to kind of just get the the flavor of it, the sound of it, right? Yeah, and um, you know, even if that ends up being some harmonics or the way the DACs are, you know, VST DSP stuff gets gets close, but there'll still be some differences. You can um, loop back your gear with Plugin Doctor and check a plugin, and it, it'll still be different, you know. Yeah. So there is some some magic to the real stuff. But um, does that magic matter? Ooh. If it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. If if it's fun for me to yeah. create the work in that way, then yeah, it matters because otherwise I wouldn't have made it. Yeah, that's that's really all it's about, you know. Right. Um, so it just depends what works for for everyone so individually. Then, I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. With that that being the massive like asterisk to this entire conversation is like, what are you looking for in this? Right? Because I even had somebody hit me up on on Instagram the other day and they asked, Hey, what would you give this rating for the S 2400, the MPC 3000 and the Octa track? And I'm like, those are completely different. Like I look at them as completely different machines. I'm like three K, maybe the sound Octa track. That's my mixer 2400. It's good for drums and quick stuff, but it's all like really just depending on what you actually want to do with it. Cause as, as limiting as these older machines are they they can be pretty flexible. Like you can get a lot out of them. And I think again, if you're, if you kind of came up with them or you spent, you put years into them, you could be really fast on them. Yeah. That's like 4k. Yeah. One example, um, still with, uh, modern DSP that I struggle with is just, like if we were to sample hardware or records, just that kind of immediacy of like sample window, yes, hit a pad, sample window, hit a pad, sample window, you know, and even in, um, you know, in Ableton, that's a different process. You're converting audio to samplers or something. Now in Logic, you've got direct input into a quick sampler, which I find great because that, but again, you're, now you're opening multiple instances, you know, so that MPC example, you've got one machine, one screen, and you can very quickly capture sounds. Yeah. And they're all ready to go. You don't have to, one great thing about the MPC um, is you don't have to create tracks. That's always a thing for me in, in modern oh. DAWs. It's like, I have to create a track. Am I going to use an audio track or a Mini virtual track. sampler, yeah. which are actually the same thing, but <laughs> GUI wise, they're different. And that's one of the reasons I like trackers, which is a whole other video. <laughs> but. So there's that, that immediacy, but then once you have the sounds in, are you going to then be like, oh, I, I need a bandpass filter. I don't have one. You know, yeah. It just, yeah, you got to pick your battles. But um, for me, making music needs to be kind of fun and, and flow without having to stop and figure out a problem. So, you know, uh, there's some hardware I can, I can get to that level with and some I can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, forgive the uh, crow funeral outside I, they won't they're 
we get a lot of crows to this place. We got a lot of big trees here. Actually, speaking of, let me uh, take a quick second and give a shout out to today's video sponsor outside, and maybe I can get some of these crows to uh, get out of here or skedaddle. So uh, yeah, let's cut to that real quick. Uh, as you can tell, the crows have decided to not leave. They might gang up on me in a second. So before they do that, let me give you a quick rundown about Squarespace, today's sponsor. I've been using them for ages. I built multiple websites on Squarespace. And again, when any anytime somebody mentions they need a website or anything or a domain or something like that, I shoot them over to Squarespace, mainly because I spent so much time looking for the perfect solution for all of that, and I ended up on squarespace.com, mainly due to the price and the features. Some of my favorite features, of course, are the ability to easily sell any type of digital product, even zipped files of samples or digital downloads or anything like that. For example, I got some on my website. Feel free to go check those out. These also have links that will automatically get emailed to your customers and disappear within 24 hours so you don't have to go around chasing links or changing anything like that. Another helpful feature is the SEO optimization, which is awesome. This helps your site rank up higher on Google search results. And last but not least, the website templates that are customizable so you can quickly find one that looks amazing and then fine tune it to your liking. So if you've been looking for a website solution, I'd suggest you check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your site, head to squarespace.com slash rickytinez for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, let's get back inside. All right, so we're back and I guess after hearing all of this and hearing all these different reasons, oh, and the, the crows never left, by the way, just adds up. <laughs> but after hearing all these just different points of view, I guess, of course, all from the same person, Tata, because I mean, you've been, you've, I could probably say you've used basically every sampler that's ever existed. Because sampling is a huge part of your music, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've used quite a few of them that you always talk about. So, I mean, yeah. that's why we always talk, talk about the subject. That's yeah. pretty much why we're friends. And we're, yeah, and we, well. <laughs> I remember at NAMM, I was talking to Daniel, and I said, like, MPC 4000, and I just saw you slowly turn around. <laughs> and, then we, and then, boom, we're basically friends from that point on. Pretty much. Well, yeah. the, the funny thing is we, we essentially, you, you have more of a, it's more part of your profession than mine, but we're always trying to figure out how to do the same thing on different tools. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, in a way, I have a lot of respect for people who just never change their workflow, you know, and they, um, as prolific as I might be, they're probably a lot more prolific, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, but, you know, whatever's going to make it make it fun. Um, yeah, I know. It's so funny because another um, crazy producer is DiBiase, and I think it's at some point, in someone's artistry, you get so comfortable with your own work that you know, like it gets to a point where no matter what tool or instrument you're using, it just always sounds like you. And that's DiBiase. I remember he used that like Millennium Falcon Casio sampler and made like the hardest hitting beat on that thing. And I'm like, how? Even with the OG circuit, when I first took him that through Novation, and he like played something. I was like looking under the table for extra gear. I was like, how are you getting these sounds out of this device? You know, um, maybe that's maybe that's a big reason why someone should or should, oh, well, I don't know. Man, my, my brain is scrambled right now because I'm trying to figure out why someone shouldn't buy a vintage sampler or why it's a bad idea. Because it wasn't until I kind of took a couple steps back in time gear wise to make music with more vintage dollless hardware that i was like oh this is how they got that 90s house sound by the gear that they had at the time you know because i went from ableton to that and ableton was super polished and gray and flat and i had to like really work it to get it to sound like older gear instead of just using older gear but then of course that comes with all the headache. I'm rambling at this point. Why? Why would you say someone should not get an old sampler? <laughs> That's such a broad question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's tough to think. Everybody has kind of said make that choice themselves. I would say don't get it if it's incredibly overpriced. You know. Like, oh my God. I think even... a lot of this tech came from. Uh, gear that was kind of losing its value and that's I feel like that's what shaped a lot of genres um, even taking the old Roland machines for example the 303 
Yeah, I mean, I got my 202 and 808 for 500 bucks, and even on that day, it was like, mm, should I? I you know. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> so, I don't think these, I, I, I would say even the manufacturers would say, don't pay that much for it. You know, yeah. I could be wrong. So I would say that would be the main reason, because there is so much tech out there, there's so much to explore that, um, you know, there might be something else to discover, something that's, again, like the Casio example, something yeah. that's very special, that's not overpriced. Um, right. And there's a few boxes like that out there. Um, you know, you're still a big SP404 fan. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of really fun gear with a lot of vibe that's worth checking out. And then, you know, I think another thing, I don't know if this is a reason why you shouldn't, but I, I thought of another little point which is sort of, even though it's sort of all digital tech, I still feel there's some, quite a bit of value, again, to the intricacies of the hardware instruments. So, again, it could be DACs or errors or aliasing, whatever, depending on the, the error we're talking about. But it can be, like, the difference between, like, a grand piano and the best contact library piano, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, maybe the end result, some, not everybody's going to know the difference, but but those kind of in the no will and just the joy of playing that instrument is gonna it's an instrument you know yeah. it's not a it's not an emulation of an instrument so i think that's really the the distinct line uh and then and then it just depends if that works for you better than the emulation because you can have a hundred emulations running at one time or just one instrument so yeah or a you know midi up instrument so I guess that is actually a pretty good point. And I wonder at what point also is uh, is the manufacturer who makes gear, because a, a part of me wants to say, well, maybe manufacturers could focus more on creating character or sound of a machine versus trying to make something to please everyone. But I guess you don't know what pleases someone until it's out. And again, it's not like, you know, Akai was trying to make the lo-fi boom bap sampler of the century. Right. They were just like, what parts are available right now? Let's just make it with with that. So I wonder if well, this would be invalid, huh? To the, to the example of the 3000 again, like I think you'd agree that's a really special instrument. I've seen yeah. clips of Roger Lynn, which that was, you know, everybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the last machine he was properly involved in I've, mm -hmm. I've seen Through clips car, yeah. right of course okay and that was um i've seen clips where he's very adamant about the position of everything being very important and that's something you don't see in a lot of instruments that's something that you hear about in other tech you know whether it's like cars but of course for us it's like instruments and the design of that and that's very special so i think that's also what made that machine really special. Like if, if a reissue of a 3000, it would never happen, but if a reissue of a 3000 came out today, would that even work for anybody, you know? Yeah. Because I think, again, it's that historical kind of experience. It was that kind of like gradual graduation to the next level. So yeah. it's like, you have to go back like that. It just it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, And with the new tech, it's expected to have everything. So... It's it's a difficult uh, it's yeah, a difficult it's, industry. You it's know? the the try to please everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Mar Marlo Diggs, another really dope YouTuber, did uh, like a I think like a week or two ago did a video on how sixteen levels kind of like changed the game, you know. And I I am obsessed with sixteen levels. That's still a, a really amazing feature is to because every other hardware example I've had except for like using an SP, but that was way more limited. Like, um, it's so great, because even using other Akai samplers, if you wanted a range of different notes, you'd have to set up a key group. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, just to be able to hit a pad and go, okay, I want to play this chromatically. Even in, in Ableton, you still have to, if you're working on the drum rack, you'd have to create another MIDI track and point it in there. And even as fast as that is, it's still not as fast as just you know, sixteen levels. Bam, and I guess the the machina will, yeah, will do that. But then you again, I'm I'm sort of like, there's a lot of options in there, so I get a bit lost, you know. Yeah, um, that's kind of the same with the the S twenty four hundred because I've, 
always wanted the SP1200 or the 12 or the turbo, but I've never pulled the trigger on it because the astronomical prices. And I even know that um, Dave, Dave Rossum, right? Rossum, he went and reissued a couple of them with a bunch of old parts or something. What was it? I'm not totally sure. I'll probably but like I think you had to have a machine already, and then for 7500 bucks you get a new one or something. But yeah, again, I think so yeah, anyway. it just becomes a luxury item. I think this yeah. stuff shouldn't... If you, if you find stuff, it should be a decent price, and then it might make more sense. Right, so that's why I never pulled the trigger on it. So then using the S2400, I, in my video about it, I was like, I think this is kind of how the original one worked, because why else, why the hell would you make it do this, you know, today? Because I know it's trying to stick pretty close to the footprint, which you have a lot of experience with, and we talked about it earlier, I was like, yeah, there's no LFOs, there's very basic, like, modulation. Well, the, yeah, again, the original had none of that. You yeah. Had, and you had 32 buttons, and then I see, volume. Yeah, you know? and I even see, like, you know, you got eight levels, I was like, well, you don't have 16. Uh, so. Yeah, but you're talking again historically. Well, exactly. it's, it's weird, to, it's weird to take it back with modern features. So that's an instrument that can be approached different ways. You know, It's definitely easy to start to notice the things it doesn't have. But yeah. when I approach it, I try to keep it very you simple. You see all the things it does. Yeah. And but again, coming from triggering delay units that can keep one sample with trigger outs from an 808, we're talking, you know, old New York hip hop, to going to 2.5 seconds with built-in drums, but 2.5 seconds for samples and being able to, you know, it was just such a big upgrade. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's the point of the video, right? Do these machines make sense today? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I guess I approach them in a different way that somebody, you know, I've got students at CalArts, like their first experience is just getting very quick and deep in Ableton and just mm -hmm. knowing so much about it that I'll never know, you know, so yeah. um, their perspective on using something like that is completely different than mine because yeah. I can remember having a tough time with trying to fit the sample I want into the right. limited sample right. time but that's that's what made things creative like for me one of the things about the old machines is the polyphony like you would accidentally start to cut samples off and start because to choke them up yeah you only that had eight that. voices yeah see so it, it's all about happy accidents i think yeah and it, that's where a lot of the magic comes from so that's something i don't get so much with the modern gear is happy accidents right so i mean we could go on forever and yeah. ever but i think i think everybody's kind of getting where we're coming from with it i mean i think we both love Vintage technology, new technology, DSP, all of it. You know, yeah. all of it has wonderful things to offer, and all of it's like inspiring for me when I watch. You know, everybody that we watch, like you yeah. mentioned, YouTube. I watch that channel too. Watch yours and whatever else, right? Yeah. And then school and just friends that we have. I mean, it's all, it's all inspiring. Gumbo. It's all in the pot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I will say. I guess in a, in a way you might agree with this too. One thing that I that buying vintage gear, um, one reason I find buying vintage gear worth it to me was because when I got this, I bought and sold it twice. This is my third one, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna put a hard drive in here, upgrade this, max the RAM, change the pads out, so I don't sell it because every single time I sold it, I regretted it. And I was like, just learn this thing. And I finally learned it really well. And I realized it taught me so much about like Ableton Live and synthesis, cause it has a good routing in there and like envelopes and stuff like that. And I was kind of a visual learner, but it made me realize the endlessness, its limitations made me realize the endlessness of DAWs or newer modern samplers that I was able to then fully exploit what these machines, the newer machines are capable of. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, I could do, I could do this now. Like that was literally impossible. Like would never cross my mind back in the day as in me using one of these. Right. So I would say in that sense, it's, 
it's good to kind of go back and see the struggle to then be like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that. Or right. like, yeah, like, um, like you're saying, pitching stuff up and then bringing it back down or having eight voices instead of, you know, cause like, I remember I would load up analog in Ableton Live when I first got it and I'd be like, voice is eight, why? Voice is 32, like endless, you know, like forever. And then eventually I was just like, oh, I actually really like stuff choking so i was like let me get a three voice paraphonic so i only have one envelope and i was like oh yeah this is the sound you know well yeah that's a great point because uh that's something else maybe we left out is using some of this stuff or just remembering how it works it does inspire me to like well we'll have these conversations a lot like yeah. how to replicate oh, this flow right, in modern right, dogs right, right? Yeah. or just something as simple as the per note different semitone aliasing of something like the sp or the mm -hmm. 2400 and how something using something redux or something similar doesn't have the same effect because it needs to resample per note and that's again something about the hardware and the dax and the the value of having the real machine right yeah. um so sometimes it's these little intricacies that are like oh, how how would you recreate that and it turns out to be like this really intense project and it's not worth it so in a way the vintage gear will will kind of uh prove its value yeah because of those facts if, if that's something that you want right yeah I mean, um, they're just they're just cool to have but again i think it's it's instruments versus emulation of instruments and that's yeah. it just depends what you want to use you know yeah. like or a lot of days trying, i'm fine with nothing but emulations right yeah exactly yeah. exactly what, are, what what is what are you actually trying to do because if you just want the sound of it you know, I always, I used to always make this joke where I was just like, yeah, if you don't have a real 909, just use the samples. No one's going to walk off the dance floor. Like, that's a sample of a 909. I'm out of here. You know, it's like, it doesn't really matter, you know? I mean, you come over all the time. I've got one and it's usually hanging out on the Parked on the sideways. Floor. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, everybody. But I mean, you've had, had the thing for... Leaning up against an 808. Actually, it used it today. Did but, you? Um, you know, I've had it for 30 years, so... Um, <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, and it's it's yeah. not supposed to be, you know, at the time of filming, what seven grand or something like. No, oh, dude, um, how much was it brand new? I don't even know, but not seven grand. I mean, ours was free, <laughs> so that's a appropriate price. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Well, either way, we can go on and on and on about stuff like this. Um, and we definitely will. Yeah, we are. Once these uh, cameras aren't rolling anymore, we definitely will. But if you enjoyed this, please let me know because I would love to do more stuff like this. And uh, a way that I can find out if you did is, of course, um, there's a thumbs up button. I hate saying this so much. Down below, hit the like button if you like. Or hit the dislike button twice. That will let us know for sure. <laughs> or I, I'm also curious to know if you have any vintage samplers and which is your favorite or the one that you've been like the most sought after because there's been some that i've gotten or i was like oh i finally got it the eps 16 plus that finally got it first jam the eps I used it 26 like, mono seconds this is garbage it's not that's my, <laughs> that's my favorite <laughs> all right we got to duke it out after this but, but uh, uh yeah leave your leave your own techniques or emulating vintage oh, yeah. classics techniques there's so much yeah. stuff to learn that so much stuff really to cool. try yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, until then, John, my man. Hey, man. Good appreciate to, it. Good and, to be on. Yeah, it's not like you're going to leave the second I hit. Uh, anyway, you're going to be here for a bit. But uh, anyway, I appreciate all of you, and I hope to see you again next week. And until then, you already know the drill. Share the love. Share the knowledge. Knowledge is power. Peace. I'm just going to the camera for 20 seconds. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs>